Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bruce Ives, Chief Executive Officer of Life Moves, an organization dedicated to ending the cycle of homelessness. Bruce has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Mark. So Life Moves, it's really the name that says it all. Talk about Life Moves and your clients. Well, the name does really say it all. And in fact, we went through a rebranding exercise to choose a new name for the organization just last year because the organization grew out of two smaller groups that had merged together, Shelter Network in San Mateo County and Envision the Way Home in Santa Clara County. And when the two were put together to become the largest provider of homeless shelter and services in Silicon Valley, the temporary name was a merger of the names, Envision Shelter Network, which I'm not a branding expert, but that one doesn't really trip off the tongue. So when we went to look at renaming the organization, we talked very intensely about our mission and about the people we serve. And our mission is to return homeless families and individuals to stable housing and self-sufficiency. And the key to that is not so much the clean and safe shelters that we run, but all the programming that our clients go through to get back to stable housing and self-sufficiency. All the moves that they make to turn their lives around. And we started talking about this move and that move and life-changing uh, programming and services and the life moves just kind of came together really because it helps us focus on the clients and what they're doing more than on the shelters um, or the services uh, or, the, or the fact that they're homeless. And talk about, talk about the transitions that families and individuals go through that lead to homelessness. Where do your clients come from in terms of their own childhood, their own adolescence and their own adulthood? It's a really good question um, because when most people think of homelessness, they kind of think of the person they see on the street pushing a shopping cart. Um, and that's a big part of the homeless problem, those chronically homeless individuals, many of whom struggle with mental health issues or with addiction problems. Uh, but family homelessness, while it has some of those characteristics, is really very different. Um, it's a lot of families who are living paycheck to paycheck and then one thing goes wrong. Someone gets sick, someone gets laid off, there's a divorce, and suddenly uh, in this very expensive housing market that we live in in Silicon Valley, there's no place for them to live. Um, most of the people we find who are families who go homeless are first time homeless. And, and the good news is with our program, we can return them to stable housing and self-sufficiency to the point where they don't become homeless again. Um, but for some of these families, as your question suggests, there's a cycle of homelessness. Um, a lot of these folks grew up in poor families, um, didn't necessarily have the best role models for parents, um, and, and struggled with poverty growing up and some deficits from that. A and clearly, too, there were, there were lacks in education um, that sort of locked people into jobs today that are service sector jobs that really don't provide a living wage for somebody living in, in Silicon Valley. Talk about how you shape your services. How do you shape an organization that is able to respond to these different circumstances of your clientele? Well, it's a great question um, because it really gets to the fact that every homeless family, every homeless individual is different. You may see some common themes along the way, but somebody may be struggling with addiction. Somebody may have mental health challenges. Somebody may have just gotten laid off uh, and can't find the next job. And those are different services. So somebody who is struggling with addiction, how do you deal with people who, who are trying to get clean or perhaps are, are using but, but, but really are trying to get on a different path? What kind of services do you provide? So it's, it's, a, it's a real collaboration. I mean, first and foremost, what we do with everybody who comes through the door is we do an individualized case plan for that person or that family. Um, it says, this person may need mental health counseling. This person may need addiction services. But it's not one size fits all. And then once the case manager has identified what everybody needs, in addition to finding stable housing, then we work either internally, or we have mental health interns, PhD students in their third year who are providing counseling to our clients, or connection to drug treatment centers who we partner with. So that within our own resources or through our partner resources, we can put together a program a support plan, a work plan for that individual that not only helps them find stable housing, but helps them work on the conditions that made them homeless in the first place so that when they get back to stable housing, they're connected to services, they're connected to support, and they can stay self-sufficient 
and never go homeless again. And part of it is dependent on how you define success for yourself. If you define success in serving 200 people annually, um, you could fill up your units and serve those same 200 people and then serve the same 200 people next year and, and really not have a highly leveraged service. If you're not creating transformation, you're providing something useful, you're absorbing a lot of resources in doing that, and you're creating a very codependent environment. If, on the other hand, you define your success in terms of how many people you serve annually with your limited resources, then you want to try and develop as much uh, energy toward independence as possible so that, you, so that as people become independent, you can serve someone else. How do you embed incentives and a culture into the organization that strikes the right balance? So it's a really good question. And I think we define success the way you're defining it, perhaps with a little amplification. So we have 700 beds all in. We can serve beds for 700 people, essentially, um, on any given night amongst our shelters. Half of those are children. Um, and we have wait lists at all of our shelters. And there's over 8,000 homeless individuals in the area we serve in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. So there's a huge pressure, as you say, to, to move people through the system and, and fill the beds. The faster we can move people through, the more people we can serve. And that helps us get our total number served. Now, you have over 200 employees, I think 225 That's uh, correct. employees, and a whole range of volunteers as well. We over 15,000 volunteers in any given year. We couldn't do it without them. And what is your budget? So our total budget is just about $18 million. Mm -hmm. About 60% of that comes from the public sector, from grants and contracts, about 40% private. Um, we're looking, the trends we're seeing, federal funding is going to be flat to down right. going forward um, from HUD and VA and the other key sources we have. So we're looking at growing our local government resources in partnership with you know, cities and counties, and also trying to increase our private fundraising from individuals, from corporations, from foundations. How much of that money is spent just on the housing stock? In other words, it basically passes through just to, just to fund the actual housing that you have, its upkeep, and so on. Yeah, so most of the shelters we own, or a county will own them, or Mid-Peninsula Housing, a community organization, and you know, lease them to us for a dollar. So fortunately, we're not paying market rents for any of the housing that we're in. And there is some upkeep and maintenance with the facilities, but the vast majority of our expense is actually is in our staff. We have a supportive side. Yeah, we have 150 full-time employees and 75 part-time. Um, and part of that is running shelters 24-7. All of our shelters operate 24 hours a day. We're not the kind of shelters where people are asked to leave in the morning, hang out on the street, and come back at night to save yourself a shift. We're always open. Um, so part of it is staffing for that model, but frankly the most expensive part and the part where we really need to raise private funds to supplement is beyond the room and a board. It's really the intensive case management, the child support coordinators, the mental health interns, all the supportive services, the housing specialists, everybody who really helps us implement our program and works with the families to get them back to stable housing and self-sufficiency. That's the bulk of the cost, and frankly, that's where it should be. So let's say you have 100 families coming in and 100 individuals come in to your, to your, uh, to your housing stock and to your programs. They, they go through the process and then they exit. How many of them, of, of the 100 families, 100 individuals, how many end up coming back and how many end up transitioning to stable housing solutions? It's a great question, and this is the number we really watch closely, is how many people do we successfully transition to stable housing and self-sufficiency who don't come back into our doors, who don't come back into the system. For individuals who work with us in our program and then leave our shelters, 78% of individuals find stable housing and self-sufficiency. For families, that number is 92%, uh, and that's really kind of the, the gold standard that we measure ourselves by is how do we hit those numbers and, and grow those numbers even higher, although they're at pretty high levels, so that we're trying to measure ourselves because those are the numbers, frankly, that line up exactly with our mission. What do you see for the future in the next three, five, and 10 years? I think the future is pretty exciting for us, but there's also some real challenges. Challenge. Yeah, so we've come through the merger. We're finally now four years past, and they, they say in the private sector or in the nonprofit sector, you really need three to four years right. to fully stabilize uh, after a large merger.
Uh, we've come through a period, a period of financial instability to a period of financial stability. So now all the focus is on the question we talked about earlier, how do we grow our impact? Um, and that's looking for incremental ways to increase our beds, maybe on sites where we already have permits. We've got some of that work going on. Uh, maybe it's ways to increase throughput. So somebody we're serving in four months, we can serve in three months and open up the beds quicker. And then there's the larger question of just how do we do our jobs better? Especially where the job isn't just to house people, but it's really to give them these life skills, to help them make their life moves, to get back to self-sufficiency. We're doing some very innovative work um, around theory of change to kind of go through and break out everything we do in our model to measure what we do and build a database kind of tracking how we're doing that with all of our clients so that we can then go back and look through the big data and see if there's any themes that emerge. You know, these clients who got this service are showing a much higher rate of success after they leave the shelter than these other clients. And maybe this other thing isn't working at all. Well, let's cut this and double down on the stuff that works. So it's kind of bringing some of that private sector big data analysis. Bruce Ives, thank you so much for sharing the work of Life Moves with us. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure.